Hi, welcome back. In this video, we're going to be talking about Out of Sync by Ven Begamudre, uh, which I hope I'm pronouncing right. Um, and just a couple notes at the top before we get into it. There's a lot to take in with the story, um, and there's going to be kind of a whole bunch of areas to talk about. And um, we're, there's a lot more, obviously, to talk about than what I'm going to be able to cover in the span of five or so minutes. So uh, let's go ahead and hop into it with that said. And as always, we're going to start off with an opening passage. They cast me all the way to the other side of the world, he said. We are the spirits of the Aurora, they sang. The Aurora of the spirits. They? It was many voices. It was one voice. Maybe the Khand never did speak with one voice the way some of them like to believe, just as some of them like to think humans speak with one voice. When a Khand looks at you, all it sees is a human, not an individual, distinctive being. When they look at me, all they see is a demi. And with that, let's hop into the summary. Um, in this summary, we're going to talk a little bit about the setting first, because it's a pretty um, dense setting for a short story, and then we'll get into the plot itself. Out of Sync by Ven Begamudre follows um, our main character as she navigates society on a planet with rising tensions between settler humans and a native alien species. The story takes place on Andaman Bay. Um, where humans live well off in an expanding set of domed buildings. The bay and the planet uh, was once solely inhabited by a group of aliens known as the Khand, and the Khand were originally formless, immortal, illuminated, and timeless beings. However, humans introduced not only the concept of time to the Khand, but also gave them form by introducing more oxygen into their atmosphere. Um, we're not given too much detail on this, but too much oxygen would kill them, but the additional presence has somehow allowed them to be somewhat tangible. At one point in the past, humans and Khand slept together, creating a third group known as the Demi. The Demi can shift between being formless and solid at will, and are famous for their sense of humor and their inability to forget. Above and beyond this icy bay is an aurora filled with, or possibly made, of odd Devasi. Uh, some humans think it's a myth, but the Adivasi are the living ancestors of the Khand, which takes us into our story in the plot. Um, the story itself is divided into four scenes. The first is the window, where our main character is observing the Adivasi from her domed building, thinking about the death of Cassie, a settler who wandered off in the direction of the Adivasi and died, and worrying over the potential threats from her Khand servants toward her children. The second takes place weeks before the first at a dinner party with the settlement council. Cassie is planning to lead the group that the Adivasi, sorry, Cassie is pleading to the group that the Adivasi want the humans off their land, and the group appears to the lone demi on the council, a man named Harun. He gives a comic but carefully worded answer, and the scene ends with Cassie asserting that the Aurora will turn red with human blood unless something is done. The third scene is back in the present as it's revealed that Harun and our main character have been in love. Harun has been slipping through the walls at night to visit her, and Harun reveals that the Adivasi do exist and that they're different from how either the Khand would like or the humans would expect. The fourth and final scene has her main character meeting a Khand who goes by the name of Henry IV, Part 1. Uh, she treats the Khand as an individual unlike how most humans treat the Khand, and the story ends optimistically with the sky a calm blue and yellow as her main character decides to introduce Harun to her children. Which brings us into our kind of notes for this story. Um, and we're going to be a little bit more kind of broad because, again, there's so much to talk about and cover with this story. Um, first is that you can make connections between this story and kind of um, past discussions around time as it's related to colonialism, right? Whether that's the myth of the timeless Hopi um, or the introduction of clocks and Gregorian calendar globally and how perceptions of time were changed by colonialism. Um, another area we can look at in the story is the effects of colonialism on settlers as well. Obviously, colonialism affects those like colonized um, but this story makes a careful point to note how it also affects the settlers as well um, in a different way. The Adivasi didn't drive Cassie mad. It's avoiding contact that drives a human mad and not simply contact with those we love. Cons are all around us. And yet, just as many humans pretend the Adivasi don't exist, so most humans treat the con as if they too barely exist. And a third area we can kind of look at in the story is colonialism as a system and not an event, Right. Rather than being colonialism, the literal, uh, you know, construction of those domed buildings, 
um, it's an ongoing system. And it's really emphasized throughout the story, um, whether that's the interactions between Henry and her main character at the end of the story um, or earlier events as well, right? It's something that has to be um, dismantled. It's not an event or something that is just a historical moment in time. It is an ongoing thing, which takes us into our big question for this story. And one of the big questions of the story is, why does the story end on an optimistic note? What are the moments in the story that justify this optimism? And what do these moments suggest about colonialism in the real world? As always, cite the text and any other sources to support your answer. I um, hope you enjoyed this story. Thanks for watching.